Welcome to a special bonus episode of Public Power Underground. Public Power Underground is the energy industry's premier infotainment program that covers electric utility and electric utility adjacent news from a power department's perspective. I'm Paul Dockery, the creative director of Public Power Underground and manager of the power department for Klatskin IPUD. In this bonus episode, Matthew Shretnick, Crystal Ball, and I talked to Elliot Mainzer in person at NWPPA's annual meeting in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Elliot is the president and CEO of the California Independent System Operator, and we talk about governance, transmission, price formation, stakeholder engagement, CAISO's new five-year strategic plan, and play a fun intermission game to break it all up with some energy-themed gifts. This is the second in a multi-part series on electric market enthusiasm. We referenced the first video with Jacob Mays, Professor Jacob Mays, uh, during this conversation. So if you aren't familiar, you can feel free to go back and check it out uh, if you haven't yet. It was outstanding, if I do say so myself. And Jacob, if you're listening, well done. Uh, I hope I live up to your expectations. Matt and Crystal are regular contributors to Public Power Underground, but in case you aren't familiar with our podcast, a brief introduction. Matt is the Power Planning Supervisor and Staff Counsel for Eugene Water and Electric Board, normally shortened as EWEB. EWEB is a water and electric utility that serves the community of Eugene, Oregon. Matt is a special correspondent for Public Power Underground and a regular participant in these bonus episodes. Crystal Ball is the Deputy Director of the Pacific Northwest Utilities Conference Committee, normally shortened to PNUC. PNUC is a not-for-profit trade association of consumer-owned and investor-owned electric utilities and other power industry partners that share a common interest in the efficacy and reliability of the Northwest Power System. Crystal is a longtime contributor to Public Power Underground with the distinction of being the Leslie Nope of utility enthusiasm and having the superpower of bringing good ideas together. With that intro, I'll hand it over to Matt to get us started. We started in hard times to bring us all in Into the laughter through thick and through thin For public power enthusiasts without and within Roll so on Today, Crystal, Paul, and I are joined by Elliot Mainzer, the President and Chief Executive Officer of the California Independent System Operator. The ISO is responsible for managing the flow of electricity that serves 80% of California and a small portion of Nevada. The CAISO also runs a real-time energy market for utilities in eight western U.S. states and conducts reliability coordinator services for most balancing authorities in the West. Elliot started in his role at the ISO. Uh, as, well, yeah, Elliot, start, and we're going to, we're, I'm going to mess up a bunch, Elliot, and then we're going to edit it out. It's going to be fine. This is completely natural. Elliot started in his role at the ISO on September 30th, 2020, following a successful 18-year career at the Bonneville Power Administration where he was at the forefront of transformational changes in the Western electricity market. Uh, While serving as BPA's administrator and CEO from 2013 to 2020, Mr. Mainzer effectively navigated the agency through a period of tremendous industry change and economic headwinds by improving the agency's long-term cost competitive and financial resiliency, modernizing assets and system operations, and positioning BPA as a more responsive and agile business partner. Elliot is a native of San Francisco, but this is something that I know about him and maybe not everyone does. He spent the summers of his youth in Southern Idaho, where his mom is from, chasing after cousins in the high desert. Elliot has an undergraduate degree in geography from UC Berkeley and a master's degree in business administration and environmental studies from Yale University. Mainzer and his wife, Margaret, who we all love, have mm-hmm. twin boys, and he is also an amateur jazz saxophonist and dedicated student of jazz theory and history. Elliot, uh, first question, and, and hopefully the easiest, may we call you Elliot? Yes, please do. Thank you very much. Um, welcome to Public Power yes. Underground. This is awesome. It's so great to be with you guys. And thanks for having me. Very excited to have you. And so you have personal history. You worked with both of these yeah. before. I uh, this is my Please. first time having a conversation with you. So thank you. This is great. <laughs> this is great fun. Yeah, good to see you. Yeah. Nice. Hopefully we can keep it light and conversational. I will warn you. I probably will interrupt you every once in a while. Okay. I'll be respectful. But you know, we gotta have a conversation. It's gotta be fun. We I are having sure. fun. Yes. We are yes. Fun. yes. Yes. Currently, there will also be <laughs> gifts. Uh, there will also be gifts in an intermission game, which I love. It's great fun. It's. It's. <laughs> this is what I enjoy. Yes. Dorky conversations with gifts. Yeah. I know. 
Well, we have a lot of history together. Uh, you and I worked together at the Bonneville Power Administration. It's so good to see you after such a long time of not seeing each other. And it's been so much fun to be here and to be in person. Very re-energizing. Mm -hmm. um, but Elliot, let's start with some news. Uh, recently, on May 16th, you announced a new strategic plan for the California Independent System Operator, which you describe as a roadmap for the next five years. The version is, or the vision is to operate the world's most reliable, well, let me go back, the world's most reliable, cost-effective, and environmentally sustainable power system. And the strategic plan includes five objectives to get there. This looks very familiar because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we did something similar at, at Bonneville um, and it had a lot of success. Um, but can you tell us how did you develop the strategic plan um, with the CAISO and what do you think it will do? Yeah, well, thanks, Crystal. You know, I, I think for those of you who were familiar with my time at BPA, it was a time when we needed to get real focused real fast, right? The competitiveness challenges, uh, the issues with the federal system, et cetera. And I found that for an enterprise of that scale, we really needed to be super crystal clear about our main priorities. Okay. And, you know, coming down to California to the ISO, the ISO is another one of these organizations that's sort of at the center of a lot. A lot is asked of it being pulled in a lot of different directions, another place where you really need to be clear about your most pressing priorities. So in a, in a similar fashion, you know, we, we started out kind of internally, uh, tapping into our employees, tapping into our longtime executives, managers, and kind of getting us their sense of the landscape. And then we did a lot of, we did a ton of outreach. We went throughout California, met with the regulatory agencies, the utilities, uh, the governor's office. We spoke with our board of governors. We spoke <laughs> with the EIM governing body. A lot of people from around the rest. And and lo and behold, we're able to kind of pull together what we felt were going to be our big five. Now, you mentioned, you know, we, we, we also want to aim high, right? Yeah. You know, this is not a small ball here. We want to, and the world's most reliable, you know, cost-effective and environmentally sustainable power system. We're aiming high. This is a big goal. We really want to bring a lot together. And at the end of the day, it's, it's these five key elements which now are going to become sort of the central organizing principle of everything we're doing in the same way here at BPA. So, yeah. you know, look, we're, we're running a grid, right? we got to make sure our control center is really up to speed, anticipating change, creating the right technology, the right state awareness tools, giving our system operators the keys that they need to run a grid with 6,000 megawatts of batteries on it and 20,000 mm -hmm. megawatts of solar, right? And constantly transitioning. So there's a big focus initially on the control center and on our mission critical IT mm -hmm. and also making sure that we have an effective interface between the transmission system and the distribution system. Those are just foundational elements of our reliability mission, right? The second area, talked a lot about that here recently, resource adequacy really beefing up the Resource Adequacy Foundation in California, not only working effectively with the state agencies on the paradigm and sharpening it up and making sure the division of labor between us and the CPUC and the California Energy Commission is as tight as possible, but also one of our biggest offerings is making sure the transmission planning and the transmission okay. readiness is up to speed. Yeah. Third area, building on the footprint of the Western energy imbalance market, right? That's such a success story. So fabulous. Two Ex billion dollars. Yeah. And beginning and developing a, a, in an updated day ahead market and really moving from real time into day ahead and doing the necessary hard governance work that needs to accompany that evolution. Yeah. Spoiler alert. We we're going to want to ask more questions Good. about that. Well, yeah, yeah, that yeah, it's absolutely. Incredibly you know, interesting. I, I look forward to the dialogue. Yeah. It's so, so important. And then of course the fourth area, and look, we're, we have a ton of different customers, not only in California, across the West. We have a huge stakeholder community, right? And we have to be building on a, what I think is already a good starting point, but just fabulous, super inclusive stakeholder process, not just the utilities, but also a lot of other folks that really participate in the regulatory community, the IPP community, the advocacy community. So try to create a really excellent stakeholder process and a really clean customer service experience. Yeah, did you? Yeah, no, I, one of the follow-ups, I, I think yeah. it's really intriguing um, that building good stakeholder processes is really important in, in organizations like yours and where you were previously at Bonneville. It's really important. Do you have any best practices you've learned or what you took from Bonneville to Kaiso, or what you think yeah. we could take back on these stakeholder processes? Because I think it's one of those areas where we could learn from each other on how to do it really well. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that happens is oftentimes when you send your staff out into the world, <clears throat> they feel like they need to come to the table armed with all the answers to the questions. Yeah. And the first thing you want to do is say, it's okay. Listen, you get <laughs> to listen. You get to just incorporate everybody else's ideas, right? Yeah. 
And also, we we live in a world, we know the West is a balkanized place. Everybody kind of comes to the table, what are my interests? How do you get people thinking in a multilateral context? How are you looking, really driving for win-win solutions? So, hey, I get my resource adequacy, I get my imports, I get my exports, but so do you. We're making ourselves collectively stronger by trying to solve problems in a win-win context. And that's a cultural thing that I really, you know, we try to do a lot of that at BPA. And I think mm-hmm. here, certainly for the ISO, I think when we talk about governance and decision-making, the ISO needs to be able to demonstrate that its thought process, its decision process is yeah. not California-centric. It's West-centric, right? Yeah. So that's one of the, one of the, the things I champion and, and I've dragged Matt along to champion with me a little bit is getting some more soft skills into our fields and electric mm-hmm. utilities and ISO. So it's not just our engineers and business majors, yeah. get some philosophers into right. this, mm-hmm. get some mm-hmm. psychology majors, some English majors, history majors. Sure. You, and then you like this theme. I really, I'm, I'm, I'm championing the concept. We need some more history majors in fields. And, There's and no doubt. Yeah. Got to go beyond engineers a little bit, maybe? Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> I can't resist, you know, this person to my right was one of my key people that we put out into the world to help solve problems. And Krista, go sprinkle some yeah. magic on yeah. this conversation, right? So you definitely need yeah. that kind of skill set, and it's, it's, it's a game changer. I'm yeah. not an engineer. Yeah, notoriously yeah. good listener, though, right? <laughs> You're a notoriously I good was, listener. I am so glad you brought up stakeholder process because I think it's the Leslie Nope approach to stakeholder <laughs> yes, processes. Yes, it is. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, anyway, I, I interrupted yeah. you at the stakeholder no, process. That was number four. Great uh, question. Uh, yeah. And it's it that softer side of the relationship management, it will probably be the thing that ultimately is the big difference maker. You need to get the perfect design, but at the end of the day, the human relationships, mm-hmm. in the sense people feeling heard, mm-hmm critical yeah you know so I, I totally agree and then you know the fourth area look we've you know i think we're all facing this this I, I guess we don't quite get to say we're in a post-pandemic world yet when we've still got you know somicron running around but the world has changed obviously on labor side big yeah. time and so we're really if, trying to continue to retain and attract fabulous people the kind of skills and the hard skills you described uh and doing it with a much more flexible and kind of individualistic approach and we're sort of embracing you know remote work and and giving mm-hmm. people choices and and continuing to really try to drive for a super inclusive and very positive uh, diverse workforce and and building our team and and in both on the leadership and technical side so those five areas really around the heart of operations strengthening resource adequacy building on EIM and growing the Western market, uh, continue to run a fabulous and very inclusive stakeholder process. And at the end of the day, keeping our people, you know, engaged and, and performing at the high level. Those are the core elements. And, uh, you know, my philosophy is to stick with it and deliver. So you're going to hear me really uh, staying with that playbook. Oh, it sounds like a solid application of some of those sco- soft skills we were just talking about. Yeah, exactly. Keeping people together, coalition building, listening, and then acting on that new information. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a great strategic plan. It was a good, uh, it's a good framework to kind of think through and continue to engage with the West. So we're looking forward to uh, seeing you in action, to, uh, you know, imp- executing on the plan. Um, well, if I could say one other thing, you know, obviously I, I tell people, you know, I still, I'm, I'm a clearing up reader still, right? Oh, and nice. Of course, it's great. I follow the Northwest, right? Yeah. And, and one of the things that I really appreciate, particularly about Harrison and the team, is they've stuck with the plan, right? Yeah. You know, these curves that we started bending a few years ago, and John was right by my side the yeah. whole time working on that stuff. You know, the cost containment, the grid modernization, the fact that Bonneville had a fabulously successful EIM entry, and they stuck with the program. There, preserving right? the value of the system. Preserving the value of the system, you know, and and, and also really thinking hard about how to, how to position the hydro system not only to capture value, to, but to be that provider of choice the next mm-hmm. round. Those are obviously all sticking, and so you want you want to build something that lasts, yeah. right? And I I feel good that so far, it appears to be you know continuing to move in the right direction. Well, it was very familiar, but I was quite impressed. Well, thanks. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate. It. I'm glad you guys had a chance to take a look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't have missed it. I um, think it was in clearing up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Coincidence. Uh, <laughs> is, that, is that how you saw it? <laughs> well, we, we presented it at our board meeting, and, and uh, you know, these guys cover our stuff pretty closely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. What, um, so, so on on that topic, one of the uh, one of the five strategic objectives um, in that strategic plan is is to, uh, and I quote, further expand market opportunities. Um, for several years now, FERC, and in particular um, Chairman Glick, um, 
uh, has called for uh, increased regional coordination across the West. Uh, just last week, uh, during the May 17th presentation uh, that uh, Chairman Glick gave at ACP's Clean Power 2022 conference, um, he stated unequivocally, I strongly believe there will be some sort of organized market in the West in the coming years. Um, now, a point of friction, as you know, and as we discussed earlier, um, uh, for expansion of the CAISO market to participants outside of California has been governance, uh, specifically decision-making. Um, participants were able to get over that hurdle for the Western energy imbalance market, um, given its voluntary nature and the fact that there are pretty clear mechanisms for exercising uh, those voluntary rights. Uh, but that logic doesn't necessarily translate perfectly uh, when it comes to day ahead considerations, um, which brings me um, to something you and I spoke about a little bit earlier. Um, uh, Assembly Concurrent Resolution 188, uh, introduced by Assembly Member Chris Holden uh, earlier this month, this month, excuse me, which directs the ISO in consultation with uh, California balancing authorities to produce a report by February 2023 summarizing the recent work on the impacts of expanded regional cooperation on the state of California and that identifies key issues that will most effectively advance the state's energy and environmental goals. Uh, thanks for coming with me on that one. <laughs> it leads me to my question. Um, is this the first step towards legislative change? Um, is an additional study going to get us where we need to be? The answer to the question is yes, it is. And it's, it's been really um, something I've been extremely pleased to see happening. Two things. First of all, in as, you know, Assemblyman Holden is somebody who's been close to this issue for a number of years. Mm -hmm. right? He was involved in the yeah. earlier yeah. efforts several years ago. Um, he is genuinely passionate about this topic. He just was recently promoted and moved over to the chair of the Assembly Appropriations Committee. So he's in a very influential position in California, and this is a key priority for him. There were a couple lessons learned last time. I don't think the conversation had enough time to really percolate and for everybody mm -hmm. to really get up to speed and to be really informed about the value proposition, the different upsides, the downsides, mm -hmm. the, the elements that really needed to be managed. You did not have everybody lined up to get it done. This time, Chair Holden is clearly trying to create an environment where the folks have some chance to really soak in this, to have, okay. you know, kind of like what we did with Bonneville on EIM. Take the time, get the stakeholders at the table, yeah. make sure they really understand it, do it very transparently, take a little bit of time, get through this election year. This is an election year for Governor Newsom. I hate to say it, but, you know, regionalization is not going to probably overtake inflation yeah. or the other economic issues facing the state as his top priority. So I think we get him through that. We come out the other side in February, and you're going to have a lot of great information. Also, this becomes a vehicle for folks from across the West who really would like to help keep the Westwide market option on the table to come mm -hmm. into California and to be included in the conversation okay. to articulate their perspectives of why this opportunity <clears throat> is before us, but also what has to happen yep. in terms of governance and decision-making to be able to make it successful. So I'm very encouraged by that. And, and, you know, the folks right here in the Northwest have done a very good job of, you know, articulating their concerns and the fact that there are other market alternatives out there, you know, that's that's a competitive dynamic that's mm -hmm. that's important and contributes to it and it's, it's leverageable. So I feel great that, the last thing I'll say on this is the other thing that's really encouraging is that, you know, the major utilities in California, uh, particularly Southern California Edison and San Diego Gas Electric, Pacific Gas Electric, the public power utilities in California, you know, SMUD and LADWP and others are proving to be really fabulous partners on this. They're really leaning in and they're really looking for ways to, to support it, which is super encouraging okay. and I think different than what we've seen before. Yeah. Excellent. Um, you know, usually when uh, um, members of state legislatures can't agree on something, they'll just uh, create a study bill. Yeah. Um, this sounds like more than a study bill. This is laying a foundation to those fundamental changes um, that we talk about uh, when we talk about changes to governance. Um, what, what do we really mean when we talk about governance and what needs to change? Yeah, you know, um, <clears throat> it's the right question. And we we've had some dialogue about that earlier today, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there's governance, which is, of course, the composition of the overarching board and, mm -hmm. and the independence, right, the aggregate structure. 
it is not a sustainable outcome for this market to be governed by a board that's approved by the governor of California and ratified by the Senate of California. That's fundamentally, that's where the legislative change will have to come from. And we will be, we know that if we're moving into the broader market kind of constructs, there will be an independent construct similar to what we see in market environments in different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. I think as we, as we've also talked about, you know, the decision making process and just the general orientation of problem solving and the Mm -hmm. track record of the organization in terms of being able to look at multi lateral solutions that aren't just looking for California load service, but all of the entities that are going to participate in this market, you're going to have a lot of load serving entities, right? And so we have to make sure that we're thinking about the loads across the West and the mm-hmm. customers across the West so that the decision making is really done on a West wide framework. So mm-hmm. those are things. And I think that what we're seeing, you know, from a variety of different conversations that are opening up across the West, I think we're laying the groundwork mm-hmm. for that kind of mm-hmm. framework, which is exciting. Mm-hmm. Can I, can I follow up on one thing? Because it sounds like the way you're describing this and, and some of the conversation we heard earlier is legislative change would be a step on a path to improve decision making. It's not it's not the end all be all. You need it, but then there's more. Is that, that Have I interpreted what I've heard today yeah, and from you in, in a similar of, way? I think that's right. I mean, certainly... F- you know, the, the fundamental oversight of an independent system operator that's going to operate across multiple states has to have the representation from all of the different states, you know, right. the different states, the different stakeholders. So the governance, the design, and in order for the ISO to be able to be governed by that entity, they basically have to take the C off the California ISO, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And that yep. requires legislative change. So that's mm-hmm. the gating yep. condition. That's a gating condition. Yeah. Good <laughs> word. Good. Right. That, that's a great one. There oh, we go. I got a dang right. for you right cool. there. That's a great <laughs> one. Um, you got to get that done, right? right? And then as you s- develop the, the broader dis- you know, the nominating committees, the governance model, the way that the states look, state interests in the Western United States are extremely important, right? We know that we have a lot of public power entities. We've got a lot of local decision making, the state representation, the, the, the control over resource development and integrated resource planning. That's something that we're going to have to really work on. And then generally the way that issues are brought to the board, the way that they're framed and the way that they're, that they're constructed and solved in a multilateral basis. That's okay. where the decision making process also happens. And these boards that will have broad representation will also be a forcing function and a, and a control process to make sure that that happens, right? Yes, go ahead. I was, and on the benefit side, that decision making, making sure that the benefits go to um, the entities that they're supposed to go to, they're supposed to flow. That's right. And also, you know, look, we, there, are, there are a number of key design issues that it really have to be solved in, in a multilateral basis as well. And they're, they're, they, they have to guarantee regional equity, right, which is really important. They also have to, they have to support equity between the sell side and the buy side, right? I mean, when we talk yeah. about you know f- price formation and fast start pricing, when it's a, it's a hot topic, mm-hmm. it's very important part of the art form here for for the market designers and ultimately the, the the entities that will be making the decisions is how do you how do we make sure that we're balancing the interests between the generators and the capacity providers and the load serving entities and their customers to make sure that we get fair and equitable pricing. That, that sends the right pr- price signals and provides fair and equitable compensation. We know mm-hmm. the hydro system wants to get paid for the mm-hmm. capability that it provides, but in a just and reasonable and balanced fashion. And I think mm-hmm. that's the art form that we've got to come up with. And I think markets across the country have grappled with that. And we're, we're looking very carefully at the other areas across the country that have dealt with some of these elements to try to find sustainable solutions to it. Paul, can I? Yeah, keep going. You're doing great. <laughs> You're doing a great listening and bringing great questions. Just, I hope you feel valued and appreciated. I absolutely Good. do, and I appreciate this opportunity to engage with Elliot on this, especially as we've been talking about it amongst ourselves. Um, $2 billion is a lot of money, um, and that was a big milestone. But when uh, you know we think about shifting to uh, the day ahead, that's a lot more. Yeah. That's what we were saying. Uh, hundreds of millions of dollars compared to the two billion. Um, or <laughs> help me out here, guys. Yeah, it's <laughs> two billion over seven years, <laughs> billion over right, seven years yes. and you're talking about billions a year, Annually. possibly. Thank yeah, you. That's the word go. I was looking for. Yeah, it's a lot of money going from a uh, real time to a day ahead. It's a big deal. It is big deal. It is. It absolutely is. And you know, you've seen me talk about you know p- part of the reason you know I, I honestly you know. S- decided to move back down and go live in California and, and, and take this job is because I watched the Western energy imbalance market develop, you know, and I saw the network of, of relationships and then 
in the actual underlying physical connectivity that exists between yeah. all those different participants. And if you can derive $2 billion of value over seven years, and remember that value curve has really been increasing just mm-hmm. over the last year as new entities. And now with, 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 with BPA in and Tacoma and others, you're further deepening the, the pool of diversity and opportunity to leverage that flexibility. Yeah. And so the day ahead kind of moves that into unit commitment and, and bigger decisions. So the opportunity is there. But again, that's also why the governance issues become even bigger because now it's not, I'm just playing this five minute voluntary market, but now I'm putting a lot of my resource base in. And so that evolution of the governance has to match the evolution of the market. Yeah. 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 And it's not only governance, right? It's also price formation. Why those the matters so much more because it's such a big, deeper market. The decision totally making agree. that stems from the governance model, the decision making that becomes possible as a result of the change in governance. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, that's a good, good way to frame it. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And, and I guess I'll just say right. that, you know, spending 20 years in the Northwest and watching, you know, California from outside the state and, and understanding all of the issues that are of primacy to public power, you know, preference for non-jurisdictional status, uh, you know, all of the issues around local decision-making and in, in sovereignty, quite frankly, it's really helpful to me to have experienced that yeah, so many does, years because yeah. I can really bring that down with me and, and articulate that yeah. and make sure that the rules that are being developed really honor those kind of foundational yeah. principles. Right? Yeah. Are you going to have show notes for this? We're definitely going to have show notes for this. Show notes. Will, you, show notes. will you put a link to Elliot's uh, TEDx talk? I didn't know Elliot did a TEDx talk. You didn't know Elliot did a TEDx talk? No, I guess I, I tried to do really good research <laughs> for this. I'll tell you what I did. I interviewed an assistant professor at Cornell in preparation for this. I didn't watch your te- te- yeah. TEDx. So, but I will yeah. go out and we'll, uh, I'll go find the link. Totally it was yeah. in 2011 it was. and it was about the EIM. It was mm-hmm. pretty interesting, yeah. Okay. And, and the hydro system and yep. yeah. other stuff. Yeah. Uh, wind integration uh, primarily and all and how that all works together. And it's it, it's super interesting. Okay. And it's well, I will both today. watch it and include it in the show. The notes. problems have changed, but not so much that it's not entirely relevant today. Yeah. Okay. We good? Good. I, 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 you know, I you, think that was a pretty satisfactory answer to the question. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I appreciate it. Satisfactory? <laughs> I'm a type A guy. Adequate, 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 right? Isn't that what we're oh, thinking? Oh, 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 I guess, I guess adequate, if adequate's better than sufficient, <laughs> right? That's good. Ooh. It's longer time. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. No, that was a fantastic answer, and thank you very much. Thanks. Um, uh, understanding the type A connection there. Um, adequate isn't good enough, at least for the purposes of this discussion. It's not um, good enough for you. It's definitely not good enough for me. Not, not when you're expecting to be blind you with brilliance right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly um uh, elliot thank you again uh we need to take a quick break uh would you please be willing to stick around and chat a bit more after intermission oh, i'd love to absolutely Thanks. thank you very much i like do you like the typewriter i love the typewriter a nice typewriter segue cool. kills it yeah. um are you willing to play an intermission game with us i am willing to play an intermission game with you. okay sure. i'm very excited about this intermission game um, we are, we're, we're calling it better know an RTO CEO by getting them to reveal their preference of competing energy interpreted gifts in a championship brackets. So it's similar to like a personality Great. preference game. Great it's like all those things. What's the, the like online website where you can go be, figure out which, if you're a Slytherin or, a, uh, you know, reveal your, what, there's what, a, there's Harry a whole Potter house. Yeah. 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 Harry Potter house. Are you? There's a whole there's genre. Myers there's a whole Briggs. genre of these Myers types Briggs of things. It has very little to do with Harry Potter. <laughs> but it's, correct. you know. <laughs> wow. We are drifting. <laughs> we are. The drift is the best. Awesome. The drift is I the funnest the part. Yeah. Um, so your response, Responsibilities. We're going to have a bracket of gifts. Um, I have shared it with you, so hopefully you got it in front of you. Um, you get to pick between these competing gifts with that. their energy interpreted gifts. Um, because the last time we did an intermission game with Deborah Smith from Seattle City Light, um, uh, Matt and Karen gave me a bunch of uh, grief and Deborah because there, Deborah. there were no winners. Um, and so for, for Crystal and Matt, we have made a way so that they can win or lose this because apparently that gives them satisfaction uh, in playing games. So um, they have already completed brackets um, where they think you will pick and they get to try to influence your choices as we go along so that hopefully they will win or lose or I don't know what drives them. And Matt um, and I are very competitive. Apparently they're very competitive. <laughs> 
Uh, but it's very similar to an NCAA bracket. And there's nothing wrong with it. It's uh, for those following out there. It's a one-two-four scoring system. Uh, those familiar will be familiar. Um, and I've checked the formulas in the spreadsheet to make sure neither of you uh, corrupted the formulas to uh, guarantee Again. your winning. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, there's a market monitor. There's a game monitor uh, okay. watching over the integrity <laughs> of the game. And one rec- one question: Which which side of my brain would you suggest I use to, to succeed in this? this so- <laughs> You've already won. <laughs> yeah, you've already, you've you've already, already won. won. The, it's just the, a question as to which one of us loses. Okay. Yes, yes, exactly. Right. Okay, so uh, in in <laughs> so it's a it's a eight team bracket, eight gift bracket. Yeah. Okay, Gifts the make one for great radio. The one eight bracket is uh, the the number one seed is Ted Lasso smells potential governance and legislative change coming, um, and that that gift is facing off against. Um, fear not, Moira Rose hath risen as a Western RT. Oh, which, and for those of you, brilliant. you I, know, I, I, I gotta say, I appreciate that. Yeah. It was a crystal ball uh, recommendation. So, um, and for those listening, you, you can see these, that both the spreadsheet and the video will be up. So which, which do you pick? Which, which better reflects your emotional response to these and, gifts? And why? Because I, I think that, that yeah. that's worth a conversation. Yeah. yeah, you know, for me, I'm 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 kind of looking at what's what's the next big step right ahead that we got to get done. And I'm a big Ted Lasso fan. I've really enjoyed that. So I'm going to pick one for that bracket. Sorry. There we go. Ted Winning. Lasso smells potential. Yeah. It's a great gift. <laughs> really great smells gift. the potential. <laughs> yep, smells like potential. Okay. Well, he's just such an eternal optimist. He's an eternal yeah. optimist, and we got to be eternally optimistic <laughs> about legislative <laughs> change. Comes to legislative change. Maybe, change. Change. Maybe it translates. He's, yes. to he's also yeah. laser focused. Laser focused. Yeah. You know, I haven't heard that one in a while. It's nice. It's, it's refreshing. <laughs> Okay, so in the two seven matchup, we have a gif of of Jon Snow facing the interconnection queue alone. This is a really outstanding gif. It's brilliant. it's a it's the right interpretation of this gif. I'm very proud of it. Uh, facing off against Moira Rose, thinks the West is ready for a resource adequacy program. One must champion oneself and say, "I'm ready for this." Absolutely. In the in the Moira Rose fashion, yeah. what what are you what are you thinking on and this I'm one? I'm going to throw my myself in with Moira with number seven. I'm we're ready for it for sure. I think that's fabulous. So the two two seed falls in the first round. Oh Crystal God. score uh, is double mats currently. Yeah, I Matt, can't believe Matt John can't Snow fell. Win now. Actually, <laughs> I can't Matt believe had Don't John too far. Snow winning. But, but okay, but not to not but, to you know right. spoil the and what a lonely place line. to be. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. we we've Standing seen I, I, we've seen stories come out about interconnection cues. It's a you know it's a national topic frequently. Mm-hmm. Kaiso is not alone, and yeah. Bonneville has a similar issue. I mean, it seems uh, from a small electric utility who doesn't have to uh, deal with this, it seems like a very daunting task. It's a, is this as emotionally challenging as it feels from it outside? It is, and you would never want to face it alone. That yeah. would just be too daunting. You need friends, you need friends. partners. Yeah. So. It turned out fine for Jon Snow. <laughs> then his friend showed up. His friend showed up eventually. Spoiler alert! What is yeah. it? Do we think Game of Thrones still gets spoiler it's alerts? Several years. Yeah, I think we're probably okay. Yeah. Okay, in the in the four five matchup, we have uh, the four seed Beth Dut- Dutton drove seven hours for one comment at your stakeholder event. <laughs> Uh, versus the five seed, the Marvel of M- Mrs. Maisel thinks electrification would be glorious. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, talk about rich characters uh, and, and, and willing to drive for such a fabulous stakeholder meeting. I had to go with number four. You went with Beth Dutton yeah, driving so far. Yeah. Are, do, you, do you watch? Are you a I Yellowstone? Do. I'm a, I'm a I Yellowstone watcher. And she is, she is a scary character mm. for sure. <laughs> Uh, but you know, I had to pick up on all the different elements of it. You know, and I think you know. Obviously, if you're driving that far, it's a compelling reason, and and uh, glad she's willing to make the trip. She's in, she's an engaged stakeholder. Engaged yeah. stakeholder. She will give you. Well, a, a very very good. I feedback. think this is really playing into your strategic plan because you've kind of gone <laughs> to like really focusing on stakeholders. Yep. And you know, electrification. We have to electrify if we're really going to make a dent in. The climate crisis, right? There's no doubt. But if we don't get RA right, 
We don't have a prayer with electrification, right? Ooh. Oh. There's like a, there's like a reason reason signaling the some Rose. of his future decisions. Yeah. 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 I, mean, I mean, it's obviously coming, but, you know, you got to get that foundation rock mm-hmm. solid. Okay. But we got to get back to the basics here. Yeah. Have you seen The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel? You know, I have not. So. Uh, the, the highest recommendation from a person you don't know, and you're getting it right now, The Marvelous <laughs> yeah. Mrs. It's it's absolutely great yeah. television. I have a couple of gaps here, you know, between running the ISO and 13-year-olds. <laughs> My spare time is a little bit limited. I look forward to nights of you know long long Netflix evenings with glasses of wine, but uh, they're a little bit scarce. <laughs> when yes. you get there, uh, you know, tune in. The marvelous Mrs. Maisel. I don't think I've it would only fail. I've seen the first season, uh, and it was fantastic, and, and it's great. But I haven't seen, Have you seen it yet, Yellowstone. I'm just told oh, no. I'm, I okay. should be well, terrified of that woman. Dear listeners, uh, the marvelous Mrs. Maisel is outstanding, right. and I highly recommend it. The three seed is up facing the six seed. The three seed is Michael Scott getting merit order dispatch explained to him, like a five year old. <laughs> Boom, <laughs> just really good. Sometimes I need this. I think this yeah. is what I need. Um, faces off a, against Dr. Fieldstone, who wants us to face the truth of how hard transmission expansions is going to be, yeah. because first you need to fa- you need I, do the do do the do the line. The truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Yes, thank you. <laughs> that, that line? Yeah. Well, everything about that gift resonates with me, right? I mean, there's just not a piece. And I, I she's a fabulous character yes. and really enjoyed her entry in season two. And so, yeah, number six. Did number you six. finally get a point? Uh, we're tied. <laughs> you're, 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 now, you're now tied. Um, so we, we are in the semifinals. Right. We have the number one seed, Ted Lasso, smells the potential of governance and legislative change coming versus Beth Dutton and the stakeholder process, a really committed stakeholder. Um, who, who, what, the one versus four, what are you feeling here? Yeah, I think um, I'm going to definitely say one is one's going to dominate there. The stakeholder process is absolutely fabulous, but if we don't get the uh, governance right, we're going we're gonna to be coming up short on stakeholder processes. Yeah. So yeah. let's go with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's Okay. Critical. And then we have the six seed has made it to the semifinals. Dr. Fieldstone wants us to face the truth of how hard interconnection transmission expansion is going to be, is facing the seven seed. We got a six, seven matchup in the semifinals. This is gonna, this busted some brackets. Yeah. <laughs> the seven seed Moira Rose thinks the West is ready for a resource adequacy program. Right. Well, look, we're trying to put all the pieces together here, right? So we got to get the resource adequacy right and, and the governance. So I'm going to uh, go with the top of the frame and, and pick – Pick uh, number seven. Okay, we're, we're going with Moira Rose. Uh, it, it has come to my attention that you have seen Schitt's Creek. You are. I have. I yes. Mean, yes. It's I so much street cred for me. Such a great show, yes. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. I watched every single episode. So. Oh, yes. Cried and the, the post end. And the post, uh, post-production. You yes. know, that sh- both these shows, that and Ted Lasso, were so timed, you know, in a yes. period of so much anguish. It was just like to be able to escape into these worlds, even when they were – at maximum triviality sometimes it's like thank you for being there <laughs> yes a hundred percent agree that is a hundred percent true you know what it's another good show that's on right now this is all going to be me promoting shows hacks have you watched hacks <laughs> no i haven't seen okay. it it's a short show uh, the marvelous mrs Maisel is an hour-long show mm-hmm. hacks is just a 30-minute show yeah. um so i had I, i'd never heard of hacks right paul posted something about it on twitter i made fun of him because he's always talking about hey as you make fun now, of me all you want shows. whatever um on the flight over here um Notice that, hey, this is a thing I can actually watch. And I had just finished my book. I was like, I'll give it a shot. It is fantastic. Oh. It's a lot of fun. Um, not going to give away anything about it, but uh, highly recommended. Hacks. Everyone would enjoy it. Cool. It's on HBO. Is this what you expected your interview with the car yeah. underground to be, Elliot? It's far better. <laughs> it's far better. Uh, <laughs> let's get the legislation done. But first, fun. we've got some television to watch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes you could use Ted Lasso as like a training exercise for your leaders that we need. It's a very hard to lead in this environment of remote work if you're having more people do remote work. The number five thing on your strategic plan, be more flexible. Management training is really important. And, mm-hmm. and you know what? You, should, you could. It's sometimes it's work to watch Ted Lasso. That's all it I'm is? saying. It's work to watch Ted Lasso There's sometimes. No doubt, it's a wonderful sometimes. show. Sometimes. Okay, we're we're into the finals. We have the number one seed is still going strong. Is blown through the bracket. Ted Lasso smells potential of governance and legislative change coming. Is facing the six seed. So we've got Ted Lasso facing Ted Lasso. Doctor Sharon Fieldstone mm-hmm. uh, wants us all to acknowledge the oh truth gosh. of how hard. Give it. A, give it to us again. Uh, the uh, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Yes, transmission expansion. Yeah. Knowing how hard it's going to be will set you free because you'll face it. But first, it's going to piss you off. Um, so we're one a one six matchup for the finals. What do you got? Yeah. 
You know, I'm going to put my final chips on number one. That's where we're going. Woo! Number one. It smells like potential legislative changes coming. I win. You won. <laughs> really and blew the, Matt away. That's the risk. Crystal that's blew the risk Matt away. You won. That's you, the you risk run. of scoring. Yeah, we could have yeah. done this. You could have all this been yeah. participants in this. I can't believe you would do this to me, Paul. Yeah. <laughs> this is the ch- this, these are the choices you made. These are the choices you made. Okay. Thank you so much. My pleasure. And, you know what? Really you won fun. the game. That's, you, 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 you won, Elliot. That was fun. You did win the game. Crystal, congratulations. Very clever. Thank you, Matt. Never speak to me again. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, uh, we got to keep going because that probably took longer than we really needed to take. But, you know, we got some good television recommendations. That was, that, exactly. We do, but I think that's your best game so far. I think 100%. Yeah, I agree. It is close competition. We did a fantasy utility draft mock draft with Deborah uh, Deborah Smith which was absolutely great it was fun but the links there were were, were with the characters right yeah. and the links here were with the subject matter yes. yeah so I think yeah. it was better for that reason yeah no, well, I, and agree. I do think Ted Lasso really matches up with this personality here yeah, here we go. Ooh, what so season three is going to start darkly, though, right? It's oh, it it might. Who knows? I and hope. I can't picture Ted playing the sax, but you know, what would you look like with a mustache, Elliot? Oh, dear, I don't want to. <laughs> Elliot, you're no, a communist, right? A rom communist. <laughs> ever since, ever since Bill Clinton played saxophone in Arsenio Hall, yeah. I've Woo. been ridiculed for for playing saxophone. Oh. Well, I've seen you, and that ridicule is misplaced. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, I think we're good. We're going to transition back at the uh, uh, one of these. I hope it's the right typewriter one. Awesome. Yes, we did it. Well done. Well done. At the beginning of this interview, I asked you about the strategic plan, which will guide the priorities of the ISO's efforts over the next five years. Your view is the success. Yeah, your view is the successful management of the transition to a cleaner electric grid requires looking very carefully toward both the short and the long term. I want to ask you about the long term and why it's critically important to think about that now. For California to meet future demand to decarbonize the grid, the state is projecting the need for an additional 120 gigawatts of clean power over the next 20 years. 120 gigawatts over 20 years. That's more than doubling the current power supply. And this electricity will come from renewable resources, including out-of-state wind projects and new technologies such as offshore wind resources. It's in the plan. Can't argue with the plan. (laughs) All of this new generation will need to be interconnected to the electric transmission grid, which undoubtedly will require additional transmission infrastructure in the West. And we all know it takes a very long time to plan, to permit, and to build long-distance high-voltage transmission lines. So tell us about the effort to look ahead 20 years to identify infrastructure needs and why you're so optimistic about getting steel in the ground. Well, you know, the last portion of your question really is, is in part, is the response. I mean, we know how difficult and long it takes mm-hmm. to get transmission infrastructure built. And you talk about those kind of numbers, you know, both within the state, offshore, into the Intermountain West, into the desert southwest. Mm-hmm. Those are issues. We have got to get ahead of those questions, right? And yeah. you really have to take the long view. And you have to look out and you have to think about different permutations of resources. And you have to think about the fundamental architecture of what you think your grid's going to need to look like. And you don't have to have it perfect, mm-hmm. but you have to start sketching it. And you have to start laying it out and you have to start building the pieces of it over time and combining long-term planning with short-term decision-making. Right. Yes. Right. We've already seen um, how difficult it has been. And, you know, in California, if you look at the numbers, I mean, just earlier this year, they ordered the procurement of about 11,500 megawatts in the next several years. We have got to have the transmission infrastructure ready to get those resources online. And that's the hard infrastructure part of it, which is so critical to get ahead of. And so we're working very closely and very effectively with the state agencies uh-huh. and, and and the policymakers in California to lay that groundwork. We just got a, one, our first package of about $3 billion worth of projects approved just a, a few weeks ago to get moving. Yeah, that's great. And I think we've laid out the architecture. Also, the softer side, you know, the long-term transmission planning, not only does it help you start mapping out the long-term architecture of what your grid looks like and helps you understand what your choices are and to get them moving, but it also serves as a forcing function to better synchronize the power planning, the procurement, and the interconnection queuing, right? These big overheated queues are, from my 
um, perspective. They're a symptom okay. of a broader problem of poor long-term transmission planning. Your, oh. your transmission planning can't react to cues. Your transmission planning has to shape your cues. Your transmission planning has to make decisions about where are the optimal combinations of good resources that meet the state's goals, siting and permitting capability, yeah. cost-effective transmission, and those become the zones, the areas that you're developing, and then eventually your cues will respond to that, and you won't have people lining up in places that you're just flat out not going to build transmission. So it becomes more of a leading indicator rather than a lagging indicator and forces the synchronization of those different processes. And the other thing I'll just mention, look, we're all watching this, is in addition to the standard long timetables, the permitting, the siting, the energization, the cost allocation, but we know we're living in a world that's getting increasing and uncer- increasingly uncertain, right? I mean, just the number of variables, that risk variables that keep stacking up right now, just in the last four or five months, we have perfect, we have great certainty that we got to bring a ton of solar and batteries and other resources on the grid, but these supply chain issues yep. that yeah. are breaking mm-hmm. out internationally, this tariff dispute that's happening with the Department of Commerce over the Chinese solar panels, <clears throat> those risk variables add other uncertainties. And so in the same way you have to have sort of a planning reserve margin okay. for your system, you almost have to have a temporal reserve margin <laughs> like for this. your infrastructure yeah. so that you can deal with the, the, the unknown risks that haven't shown up yet, mm, right? Yeah. And get after it, right? That's the key thing. So we're really proud of our 20-year outlook. The other thing that it does, the transmission plan, is it also allows California to have a better sense of what its in-state needs and then to engage effectively with Northern Grid and West Connect Mm -hmm. and the actual protagonists who are developing transmission lines to help get some of these things subscribed, right? I mean, that's okay. a key thing, right? You got to get these things subscribed, you got to get the cost allocation yeah. and you got to get them energized. So it was our offering to kind of lean out, portray that vision, synchronize process, lead rather than lag and be able to engage effectively to get some of these lines built. Along the, along those exact lines, is it a chicken egg issue and which is the chicken and which is the egg with respect to the plan versus the cost allocation issues you just described and the the um, subscription that goes along with that? Yeah, I think look, I think if you don't have a really solid plan to start with and if you don't have a really good sense of who the potential beneficiaries are, beneficiaries are you mm-hmm. know, which load serving entities really need this capacity, which entities are really diversifying um that becomes that that really is 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 leading if you think back you know years ago with with the open season processes that we ran you know at bpa mm-hmm. you know it, it turned out that what was really missing was a commercial frame to get the transmission subscribed mm-hmm. right yep. so we went out and we put transmission contracts in front of people say sign on the dotted line yeah if we can give you transmission at or below our embedded cost mm-hmm. you agree to take it and if you don't take it you're out of the queue yep. right and it became a way of subscribing lines and dealing with cost allocation because the people that ultimately needed the capacity mm-hmm. you know, help pay for it, right? right? Recall some choice comments from uh, Mr. Steve Oliver along those lines. Yeah, yeah. well, it worked in a lot of ways. Was, yep. was it perfect? No, but it, it worked. And so I think you've got to get the business case for these transmission lines sorted out. And this is encouraging watching you know, BPA and, and Pacific Core and Idaho Power finally hammer out an agreement around B2H, right? Yep. That was the missing ingredient. Once you finally figure out who needs to subscribe it, you know, your cost allocation starts taking care of itself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 12 years to get there. Right, <laughs> which is why. And you, you still have to build it. Get ahead of the curve and build it right yeah and you you talked about like the planning reserve margin on the temporal planning reserve margin that's a that's a term i'm going to use is that like slack in a schedule is that how i would think about it is that kind of what you're trying to do is make sure you you do this before you need to or i'm trying to i'm trying to make sure i understand that concept right because i'm going to use it a lot and i can use it right i'm really explaining yeah right exactly i guess what i'm saying is it's i'm not really thinking in terms of necessarily slack in the schedule although that that may be the right thing i'm just recognition that that the world that we're living in is one in which volatility and uncertainty and compounding risks seems to be escalating Know, right. Whether it's wildfire exposures or population growth or supply chain disruptions or economic things, war in Ukraine. 
Mm. Right? It's just things that are that are creating greater uncertainty. So the base case of just the basic planning and siting is already rough enough, but you have to factor in the potential for other disruptions. And it's just a greater sense, a greater rationale for, for getting ahead of the curve, moving with urgency, and really trying to pencil out the business cases for these lines. Okay. And I would say the other thing I'd mention, why it's also so important, is if we want to open up and really run a west-wide electricity market, right, and we want to basically make sure that people can depend on that market on the buy side and the sell side. We have to make sure that the interconnectivity between these regions is as strong as possible. So you're looking at it from a resource adequacy perspective, you're looking at it from a fuel diversification perspective, and you're also trying to really open up the interconnectivity so that we can really leverage fuel diversity across the West. So one thing to follow up on that concept. So I mentioned I talked to an assistant professor, Jacob Mays from Cornell in preparation for this. And he had this concept that I thought was a really interesting one, which is that transmission in some ways just a the backbone of the market. Like it's it, it you need to have uh, well-functioning transmission and interconnection. You're talking about this, right? This is what enables good value out of your market is if you have the right transmission in place to take advantage of optimization. Uh, he's a brilliant person. What's, do you have a similar perspective on the transmission being a backbone of how we operate the, the 100%. market? 100%. And if you haven't had a chance to see yet, I'll make sure that your your listeners get a link to our this map that we've put together of the energy imbalance market, right? Yeah. We have that graphic that mm-hmm. shows Great. all the transfer paths between all the different entities of the EIM. And it's it's those physics, that right. physical infrastructure and interconnectivity that has driven the economics of $2 billion of value on a five-minute energy market over right. seven years, right? And it's leveraging those physics and those economics into the day ahead and then pairing it with the third leg of the stool, which is the governance and decision-making reform. Yeah. But the physics, that, that interconnectivity is a huge asset. You think about the Pacific Northwest and California connectivity across those inner ties, the AC and DC inner ties. We talk about how many times they've paid for themselves. Mm-hmm. And last summer was a great example of the fact that it goes both ways, right? And California is a net importer. But when it was crazy hot up here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, last year, we saw which direction power was flowing, mm-hmm. right? It was coming out of California up here. So that kind of connectivity helps <laughs> in both directions. Right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And Deborah I talked about that uh, this morning um, on the EIM and being able to leverage that to help keep the lights on during the heat dome. Yeah. Have we covered the, the where we are and why and, and how we all happen to be in the same room together? No, it, it'll come in through in context. Okay. Yeah. We are in the same room together, though. We are which in the same room together. And I, and I am a little worried that this feels like a tribunal. Usually we do this on Zoom, and maybe it doesn't feel the same sort of tribunal. Do you feel like you're under, uh, like, an intense? No. Okay, great. Good. And I, 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 I feel, even on your Zoom, you guys strike a really nice cordiality. It has a good buzz, too. It's okay. the nicest <laughs> interview in public power. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. The friendliest. 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 You know, you get it wrong, Matt, and I'm still uh, charitable towards you. (laughs) Are we ready for the last one? Are we ready? We're, I think, okay. So... Uh, this is this comes from the conversations we've been having at the Northwest Public Power Association's annual meeting in Coeur d'Alene and the, the various workshops we've had uh, associated with it. But uh, like one of the themes I think is the we're kind of coalescing in the West about an incremental approach to market development. That's been in some ways um, I think a theme of people becoming getting comfortable with this incremental approach. Um, and it, your 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 market expansion is one of these things in your strategic plan, right? And and the expansion of the uh, energy imbalance market and and uh, the uh, day ahead markets to parties outside of California. Um, I I in this conversation with Jacob Mays, I'll give him another shout out. He's a very charitable person to, to spend time with me. As are you. I really appreciate it. Um, he. He kind of pointed out to me some of the stumbling blocks and trade-offs that comes from an incremental approach and not having a fully integrated model for uh, markets. Um, and, and I think that this type of approach would be unique to the West, this incremental approach. And because of your experience, because of the views you've had in the Northwest and also uh, as president of Kaiso, I was hoping you could give us your kind of head beams on what, what's important to be thinking through as far as, you know, uh, resource planning, transmission, price formation, um, and when developing these near-term markets without the full-blown ISR and, and kind of an integrated market? No, it's, it's an outstanding question. You know, something I thought might be, might be 
interesting to your you know, your Northwest listeners was something that was really fascinating to me when I when I first went back down to California and I started engaging with the big utilities in California, particularly the you know the investor owns who are housed within our balancing authority. Is when we started talking about about EDAM and and the next steps, their first reaction was, you know, do we really need to take that next incremental step? You know, we've already effectively joined. It's we're not an RTO, but we're an ISO. We've already consolidated our control areas. We have mm-hmm. financial transmission rights. We've done all the, you know, all the heavy lifting that it took to get to that point. And we'd kind of like to see if people are ready to. If we're going to talk about an RTO, let's really talk about an RTO. Yeah. And th- and I thought, but what was really interesting though is when engaging. I think with I would say virtually virtually all of the of the EIM entities who were potential candidates mm-hmm. to join into a dayhead market the the signal that came back was was very resounding that we feel that our institutional capacity for change pretty much at this stage extends into a, a dayhead market we do you know you don't have a lot of people talking about being ready to consolidate their balancing authorities or go all yeah. the way to the RTO so we have sort of said okay well then we'll take everything we've learned from EIM and let's start designing a day ahead market that builds on that framework. It is an incremental step, but you're right. It is complicated to design a market in kind of in a multilateral context where we still have what 37 or 38 balancing authorities in the West and we're all still kind of operating a little bit as islands, right? As individual yeah. balancing mm-hmm. authorities. And so so issues around imports and exports and firm transfers are one of the hardest things we got to get right right now and we saw tough issues show up you know coming out of august 2020 Mm -hmm, the wheel this wheel through issue is a Mm -hmm. really nasty problem where we have to figure out how to solve that in a multilateral context people need to make sure that they can depend if they're buying firm capacity out of a market Mm -hmm. they need to know that that's firm capacity right so that's an issue we really need to get we need to get right it's very important the i would say um, just being able to deal with imbalance Variability between the day ahead and the real time market through an imbalanced reserve product and getting that priced and 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 uh, structured correctly is an important part of the market design that will feed into an extended day ahead market or an enhanced day ahead market. And then I would say the 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 other issue is that that's certainly very important up north is you've got to get the price formation issues right. You know? Yeah. You've got to make sure that you're that you're sending the right price signals. You're dealing with scarcity appropriately. Resource characteristics are valued in a, in a fair mm-hmm. fashion, and and those become st- big structural elements. And I think the other thing is that while you're designing, the way I talk to it with my team is you have to think about the expansion slots on the dashboard that need to be there as you're building the data, so that if we do find oh, okay. that it really works that we've got a design that can be extendable into that next stage mm. without monumental cost or friction, right? And so we are, you know, I don't know, you know, we're, we're certainly staying optimistic. There seems to be a lot of interest in the West in moving to a fully integrated market. Right now, everybody says, let's take the next big step in the day ahead. Let's get those rules sorted out. Let's design a gr- really good, equitable, fair, and well-balanced market. And then we'll see if we're ready to take that you know, that following step. I think it's it, it's incumbent upon the design to kind of work backwards from that so that if we do get to that point, we've got a, a clean uh, way to get there. Mm-hmm. You're talking about slots on a dashboard is yeah. kind of the framework, mental yeah, model yeah, you the have. expansion slots. You know, you think about the, the dashboard of your car, you know, you get a, get a place for the, uh, you know, the radar detector, the altimeter, <laughs> the rest of it, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, why why would we need that? Um, <laughs> I, um, I was just kind of curious. So um, with respect to the appetite that you were referring to and the appetite for change, yeah. um, do, you, do you think that there was a connection between um, that appetite and potentially a lack of appetite for moving further and faster? Um, is there a connection between that and the fact that we have yet to make the legislative change that's necessary to deal with the governance and decision-making issue? It probably was, if I'm, sh- I'm sure in certain Parts, I think for some it definitely was. It says this is a step that we think we can take, and for some, look, not all. There's there's a, there's a heterogeneity of opinion on that. Just yep. for some people, say, hey, if, even for me to get into EDAM, I need yeah. fully independent governance. You know, not everybody says that. So there's 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 shades of differentiation mm-hmm. on that. But I actually think that while that was a contributing factor, I think people just generally saw uh, that the move from our bilat mark into the EIM, which people characterize as incrementalism Mm -hmm. was, was doable. And I tend to use the word evolution rather than incrementalism. And I think the evolution 
rather than revolution approach has mm -hmm. been the only thing that's really worked in the West. Mm -hmm. So let's that's build exactly on the success right. model mm -hmm. and see if we can take that step together and go get it nailed. Yep. I worked for a bottom middle administrator who used to say, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, yeah. You may I, know him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm guessing it was you. <laughs> Did I get that one right? Yes, I got it right. <laughs> Thank guess. you very much. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really yeah. do try. Yeah. Um, it, it, one of the areas around price formation, you touched on a little bit, is making sure as, uh, uh, as Jacob Mays I did the, I did one thing for prep. I'm going to keep it. I'm just going to keep hammering it it's for working. the prep, right? It's working. <laughs> yeah. I hope Jacob uh, listens. <laughs> that may, let's hope. Let's hope, right? Uh, is, is this idea of making sure you're, you have full strength pricing in, in your real-time markets, especially, and this is a lesson uh, he and uh, Jesse Jenkins co-wrote a paper mm -hmm. about the Texas event, uh, the, the winter storm URI. And, and one of their conclusions was if you don't have this, this, the link was broken between the market prices and the forward uh, forward price prices so that you didn't get the right signals to develop. And one of the things that's important in, in multilateral where you aren't all under the same framework is the resource adequacy program, right? Mm -hmm. And if you have different resource adequacy programs and it's I don't want to call it balkanized, but it has not yet um, demonstrated interoperability, I think is a term you were using, yep. um, that making sure you have the full strength prices to make sure you have adequate price signals that you get the resources necessary to serve the load was yep. kind of a, a, maybe I don't want Jacob to listen to this because I probably butchered it all and I'll uh, be uh, embarrass him for him taking his time. But th th there is like a message there that really resonated with me that you, like if, if you haven't yet, are you, if you aren't in a rationalized and fully integrated market, right. that those the full strength price signals really matter. Do you, I, yeah. I was going to try and paraphrase it differently and correct <laughs> me if this is what, wasn't what you were asking, but, um, what I think you were saying was, do you need uh, equivalent resource adequacy standards um, for all participants in a day ahead market in order for it to, in order for price formation to be trustworthy and dependable? Yeah, that's that's a really excellent and detailed question. I'm not sure I can give you the completely authoritative, intellectually honest answer, but I don't. Th I think that certainly there has to be a relatively, I would say, pretty levelized accountability signal for sure. Okay. You can't have one group well living said. off of a completely different PRM, planning mm -hmm. reserve margin, okay. than the other, even if they're derived yep. on slightly different footprints with even slightly different analytics behind them. But you can't okay. have one one entity say, hey, we're sitting here at 12%, and we're sitting here at 18%, and have this big spread. That can't work. Because I know there's a lot of questions now, as we watch the Western Resource Adequacy Program evolve here mm -hmm. over the next couple of years, how will, what will the co-evolution of the California RA framework look like and what will be the level of interoperability? And certainly if we are able, if we are going to accomplish a West-wide energy market, there will need to be interoperability and, and some comparability, especially as you're administering the sufficiency tests for the market. Uh, in terms of the price signal, though, there's different ways to get to that, right? I mean, you think about the New York ISO, for example, where you where you have a state reliability council that calculates, that runs the loss of load expectation analysis, that right. calculates a planning reserve margin, that applies to all load serving entities, and that feeds into a centrally administered capacity market. Yep. By yep. I don't, not really expecting us to see centrally administered capacity mm -hmm. markets showing up in the West anytime soon. So it's, right. the, it's the procurement mechanisms that happen at the utility level that are overseen by the by the um, public utility commissions and others. That's another big accountability mechanism where you're blending both capacity and energy pricing. So it sort of depends on the market context. But the, the general level of reliability metrics and accountability for delivering have mm -hmm. to be levelized if you're operating on a, on a big basis there you got a big problem yeah they're getting the entire west to agree on uh, centralized capacity acquisition is uh, not yeah. an incremental approach i don't think yep. ted lasso yeah. is smelling that <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well i think and, and to kind of come back to yeah. matt's clarification it's a, there's two different ways to think of it and talk about it right one is do we all have to be on the same resource adequacy program yeah. the other is if you aren't getting there and you aren't doing some central procurement of capacity, yeah. your energy market has to make sure its price signals can can 
sustain the resources necessary. And so there is, that's why his analysis of ERCOT to me, there, there, is a real, there are lessons to learn from that for something like what we're doing, no where it's based, the, the actual market optimization is based on uh, like energy. It's an energy market. And then we have these other mechanisms for resource procurement. Yeah. And it's not, like, it's decentralized, mm-hmm. I think is the term you use. And That's I think right. there's lessons to learn from that, quite frankly. There no doubt is with these energy-only markets, you know, mm-hmm. and, and how does that operate? And, yeah. you know, you pair that with a lack of accountability on weatherization and you have last winter, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's exactly right. Problem. Right. And that's I recommend the paper. Yeah. I'll put the paper, paper in the show notes. Yeah. I'm sure you've read it, actually, I, I'm, because I'll just well, give you the all, charity. All watched the, we've all tried to learn from the ERCOT experience. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of lessons learned there. The one thing I will say, though, and I think it's really important, look, you know, I was a, a big uh, fan of seeing the, the Northwest Power Pool develop and, and flourish. And it's yes. been fabulous to see that, you know, with Sarah Edmonds there now, it's really, really great. And, you know, I'm going to be, we're going to be watching that very closely here. And as it moves from the voluntary phase and the binding phase, you know, we really, we really want to see that succeed. And as that program develops and we see how it matures and what it's, what its end state looks like, that will be really important information for California and all of us to figure out how do we ensure that interoperability and, and that parity, right? So, you know, it'll be a, something that I'm excited to see evolve. I think you need to bring Sarah on to talk about the wrap. I would love that. I would yeah. very much appreciate Sarah coming on to Definitely. talk about the wrap. It was, uh, it was um, just to add a little bit of color with regard to the previous question in incrementalism, it was uh, Sarah's comments to um, the Committee of State Regulators in preparation for a presentation at FERC um, the first time um, the wrap spoke to FERC um, we had been receiving some criticism with respect to the incremental approach, um, and some, you know, state regulators who were very interested in, uh, to your point, just going RTO right away, all the way. Um, and you made this point again, but the fact is in the, in the West and in particular the Northwest, the only thing that has ever worked is incrementalism. Yeah. Um, if we're going to continue on the path together. I think it makes the most sense. It, it shouldn't be tainted with a necessarily bad connotation. I think that you're better off going slow and steady than trying to go too fast. Yeah. You go too fast, you blow up, whereas, you know, it's the sort of the tortoise and the hare. And I think we've been moving, the last couple of years have been pretty exciting. You know, you look at the, the growth of the energy imbalance market. And yeah, we're all just bored. There's been nothing going nothing on. Nothing <laughs> Sleepy times. <laughs> it takes a lot of energy to evolve. It does. But it's the right it's the right way to go, and you can be really thoughtful about things too, and you can adapt and learn, and then it gives you more mo- more flexibility to put the pieces together because that's the way it's going to come together. You know, it's it's a little bit of a jigsaw puzzle, and we're building the different pieces here. We're building them effectively, I think. In the next couple of years, it'll be fascinating to to assemble them into a coherent whole. Look yeah. back and realize where the where the turning points were, because yeah. uh, I, I don't know about anybody else, but I never tend to see them when they're happening. Um, but uh, all right. Um, speaking of evolution, uh, let's evolve the conversation a little bit um, before you go, Elliot. And thank you once again. Um, just wanted to check uh, quickly for our listeners: Are you aware that uh, Ron Swanson um, is also an amateur? Am- amateur uh, jazz saxophonist who performs under the alter ego Duke Silver. <laughs> Thank goodness. Um, and follow up question: Do you have anyone in your life who is willing to joke with you about being Duke Silver's acolyte or, or potentially even doppelganger? <laughs> the Duke Silver of Western power markets. The Duke Silver. There you go. Yeah. You Again, know, I, you'd need a mustache. I might be willing to wear that for like fifteen minutes. And that'd be the limit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Duke yeah. Silver's a pretty cool name. He's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> have you, know, you seen Parks and Rec yet? This has turned into just recommendations for shows. Yeah, I've got a I've got a big list coming out of this conversation. <laughs> things I got to get out. So the reference that uh, Crystal Balls the Leslie Nope of, of uh, Public Power that doesn't, doesn't mean anything to you that apparently. Not like, really. Yeah. It will eventually. It will. Yeah. I will get after it. <laughs> yeah. I always enjoy taking good neighbor, good good uh, good natured ribbing about my sax playing, but I. Will tell you it has always been a form of salvation you know just it's like you know, we all have something that helps keep our minds active and rehabilitated and any lovely. you know any form of music, the accordion i don't the care accordion. if you can play yeah. music yeah. and it makes you feel good that's yeah. all that matters um anyway thank you very much for the conversation elliot um we had a great time today um everyone around us that you can hear right now had a great time today
Uh, Paul will put links to reference materials that Elliot mentioned on the show, uh, show notes, uh, rather, and uh, some of the stuff that we mentioned as well, and apparently just about everything Jacob Mays has ever done. <laughs> yeah, no, um, obviously, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Now there, uh, also, it should go without saying, but we're going to say it anyway, you're also going to find a lot of merch. Um, now, unfortunately, to date, none of that merch comes in tall sizes. Um, I singularly, seemingly, am being discriminated against. But that aside, um, a lot of it is great. Um, I, I've purchased it for myself, even though it doesn't fit in everyone I know and love. And the T-shirt fit. You said the T-shirt was great. No, the T-shirt did fit. Okay, the, the Shrednik special was I'm great, a and point. it fit. That's all. The Shrednik, yeah. yes, it fit. Thank you. Again. You're welcome. That's all. It it's worked. T- well, it's a little long on me. Well, <laughs> there you go. The uh, the the. The shirt that Paul is wearing right now is a quarter zip, um, and it's a very very handsome, very professional professional quarter zip, and that in particular is what doesn't come in my size, and I'm, and here I'm wearing a suit where Paul's comfortable. Um, Anyway, um, thank you very much once again. My pleasure. Um, It's great to be here. We hope you had a good time, and uh, we look forward to having you back. Thanks. I hope so, too. Thanks for doing this, you guys. It's a great job, and really appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. Best to you. Hope you had fun. I did. Good. Super. We started in hard times to bring us all in Into the laughter through thick and through thin For public power enthusiasts without and within Roll on enthusiasts, roll on Thanks to Elliot, Crystal, and Matt for the informative conversation. To make sure you don't miss the next episode or other great bonus content, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, or your favorite podcast app. You can also get fabulous merch on Shopify, including the wonderful quarter zip with the demand balance constraint that I was wearing in the episode. Public Power Underground is a production of Klatskin IPUD and News Data. It is brought to you with the support of NWPPA and TEA. NWPPA was the host for the conference that brought us together and helped coordinate our recording space. A special thanks to Scott Corwin, Brenda Dunn, and Connie Filbert for the help. The Northwest Public Power Association believes in public power. You can find NWPPA at nwppa.org. TEA is our presenting sponsor for season four of Public Power Underground. The Energy Authority is a nonprofit energy portfolio management company whose mission is to help clients maximize the value of their assets and meet their power supply goals. If you know someone at TEA, send them a note, letting them know you heard their promo on this podcast. Or better yet, go to their website at teainc.org, teainc.org. Find the contact information info and send it that way because that'd be fun i would find that humorous actually send me a screenshot uh and i will uh send it to somebody because i'll find it funny and uh, maybe i'll reply with a uh, laughter the views expressed here are our own and not the official views of klatskin ipud news data pnuc eweb or kaiso uh or the organization of any other guests also appearing on public power underground public power underground is public power You know what? We changed this because uh, Sarah Edmonds, uh, we had an interview with her, just a short one, and she was like, you should market this to more than just public power. So guess what? Public Power Underground is electric utility and electric utility adjacent news from a power department's perspective. It's written and directed by Klatskin IPUD's power department, led by me, Paul Dockery, and it's written and it's edited and published by the stellar team at Pioneer Utility Resources, led by associate producer Sarah Wooden. Our theme song, Roll On Enthusiasts, was rewritten, performed, and recorded by Aaron Guillory and Ian Bledsoe. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch. <laughs>